And so we give thanks to God for His purpose. His purpose is higher than what we can ever imagine. It is beyond what we can understand. But when we come into a place of relationship with God, when you come to a place where God's Spirit is moving in your life, that is when you are able to, to know what the Bible says is good, perfect, and pleasing will. Amen. And the other way, of course, is when we begin to study God's Word. Because the Bible says that His Word is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, dividing the soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we come here, we come here to experience God's word in our life. Not just hear it, but experience it. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing. Everybody's very set to say hearing. hearing. And hearing of the word of God. So when you come, you experience the word of God and you respond to it by faith. How do we respond to God's word in faith? By doing what God's word says that we need to do. Amen. And so we are also thankful for Brooke, um, uh, Mrs. Brooks, who is here and sitting there. And we're praying for you, um, Meryl, in Jesus' name. Um, I'm going to invite you to open the word of God with me this morning to the second book of Kings, chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at verses um, 8 and 9. I think the songs that were elected this morning were right on. And, and, some, and somehow, you know, beyond our understanding, God brings everything together. And uh, so today the Lord... The message is it's time to shine. It's time to shine. Today is a day of good news. Amen. Amen. Second Kings chapter 7 verse 8 and 9. It says, And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news and we remain silent. Everybody say, this is a day, is a day. of good news. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Amen. And the Word of God says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Can we go before the Lord Jesus? Lord Jesus, we come before you. We love you, God. We thank you, God, because you are so very good. Your goodness has no measure. Your mercy has no end. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for your amazing good pleasure toward us today, this morning. Oh, and I pray, Lord, that your word, Lord Jesus, oh, in the name of Jesus, be spoken all oh, through your spirit, and that our hearts may be open to it. In the beautiful and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Can we give God a hand praise as we take our seats at this time? Amen. Go ahead and sit down. In this word of God in 2 Kings, um, Israel the, was, was referred to as the northern kingdom. And Israel was in a very, very bad place because they were constantly living outside of God's purpose and plan for them. And we see that, you know, they suffered tremendously by people who were living around them. 
But one of those countries that lived around them was the country of Syria. And the Bible says that the Syrians besieged Israel. They came, they surrounded it, they, they oppressed it, um, they, they, they took from it, they plundered Israel. And so Israel was left in a place of starvation. Israel was left in a place where they had no food. And it was so bad that people were dying. And, and when I read this word again, I started to think about the status or the place that our world is in and people who are living around us, people who, in fact, we know that are also hungry, not necessarily physically for food, but they're hungry for spiritual food. They are starving for truth. They are looking for direction. They are in desperate need of true love. And they find themselves empty and broken and miserable. And when, and, and when I thought about misery and I thought about miserable, uh, the state of being miserable, I thought about one of our pastor's favorite songs that says, Hundidos en la miseria, cansados en la vida. And I'll interpret that. It means sunken in. Sunken in misery and just tired of life. And Israel was such in a bad situation that the king of Israel, when he saw it in a particular uh, circumstance that happened that I won't say here, but the Bible says that he rent his robes. He, he had no power to change what was happening in Israel at that time. People were dying, people were starving, people were hungry, people were, were, were in the worst place possible. And when you think about people that are living around us in the same way, without God they cannot change their situation. Without God they cannot change what's going on. That hunger, that thirst in their heart and soul, they can't move away from it. Hallelujah, because they're trying to do everything without God's hand on it. Oh, hallelujah. But when God's hand is in that situation, he brings about that which is impossible. He turns the situation around. He brings about a new day. He brings about a new hope. He brings about a new purpose. The Bible said that there were four lepers that were out in the outskirts of that city. Outside of the city where the king reigned. And the lepers, again, is a, a leper in the Bible, is someone who had an infectious skin disease and was excommunicated from society. They were not allowed to be there because they were unclean. And so they were on the outside and they started talking, they started chatting, they started saying, you know what? There's nothing but death here. There's nothing for us here. I know that the Syrians are over there. And there are enemies, but guess what? Why don't we just go there? Why don't we just make the journey? What's the worst, worst that's going to happen to us? If we go there and they kill us, we're going to be dead here anyways, right? So we're between a rock and a hard place. I'm going to die here, I'm going to die there. But what if, what if in fact they allow us? Maybe we can work for them. Maybe they, they'll hire us on. Maybe we can be their slaves. And then they'll give us bread and water. And so the Bible says that at twilight, they went, they went on their journey, and as they got to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, they realized that there was no one there. There was no one there. They expected chariots, and they expected uh, all of the, the generals and the military soldiers, but they, the, all that they saw was everything that the Syrian army had left behind. In fact, the Bible says that God caused there to be a great uh, sound of, of an army. And the Syrians said, the Israelites have hired the Hittites, they've hired, hired the Egyptians, we better get out of here. So they left, the enemies of Israel took off and they left everything behind. They left, they left the horses, they left the food, they left the drink, they left all of the treasure, all of the belongings, everything that they had plundered was left behind. And so when they came into that place, 
They looked to the left. They looked to the right. They began to search the tents. And they realized, you know what? There is treasure. Everywhere we look, there is treasure. There are good things. And the Bible says they began to eat. And they began to drink. No longer were they hungry. No longer were they thirsty. No longer were they impoverished. Hallelujah. They were quenched and satisfied. And now they had been uh, transformed into rich men. They had eaten their full. And they started to get the gold and the silver. And probably stuffing it in their pockets. And putting it in their bags. And they said, you know what? There's not enough room in my wall, in my, in my, in my, in my sack. I'm going to dig a hole in the ground. I'm going to start putting this treasure in the ground. I'm going to hide it here. You know, that's your spot. This is my spot. Remember this spot. This belongs to me. And they were doing this. And they said, wait a minute. What's going on here? And they were convicted in their heart. And they said, you know what? What are we doing? There are people dying. There are people thirsty. There are people hungry. There are people miserable. Oh, just down the way. And yet here we are with all of this tre treasure. What we're doing is wrong. And they began to say, today is the day. Today is the day of good news. Today is the day of celebration. Today is hallelujah. Look what God has done for us. And so they went back to the Israeli uh, uh, to the city and they began to announce it. Of course, it wasn't so it wasn't long after that the that the Israelites stampeded their way into the Syrian camp and they began to eat and enjoy all the treasure that 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 God had provided for them. And when we look at this, it's very clear to us that when we come into the Lord Jesus, we come into a place of treasure of immeasurable worth. We come into a place full, hallelujah, of the greatest, of the greatest, of that can ever be given from the beginning of time to the end of time because God is Alpha and Omega. And that's why the Bible says, uh, even though we were thirsty, hallelujah, Jesus says, if you drink of this water, I shall give you, you will never thirst. The, the, the water that I give, in him will come a water springing up into everlasting life. When we came into God's presence hungry, Jesus said, hallelujah, I am the bread of life. If you come to me, you're never going to hunger anymore. If you believe in me, you're not going to thirst anymore. Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest for your souls. And so when we come into the Lord, in our weariness, in our tiredness, in our exhaustion, in our anxiety, in our depression, oh, hallelujah, the Bible says he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Oh, and he restores my soul. The Lord restores us. The Lord refreshes us. The Lord gives us peace and joy and comfort and strength. Oh, the treasures of the Lord are beyond all that we can ever imagine or fathom. Oh, hallelujah. And there's a word that I learned with my son Luke this, morning, this week, and it's called multitudinous. And multitudinous is a word that goes beyond numerous. It goes beyond a, a many. It's something that is like an exponent of multitude. It's something that's greater than a multitude. And I want to just confess and declare today that when we are in Jesus Christ, we have a multitudinous of blessings, of blessings, of blessings, of blessings. But we got to remember there are folks all around us to the north, south, east, and west, in every country, in every community, on every street corner, in every home. And they are in desperate need this morning. Right now, there are people dying spiritually and physically in every single way. And just like the lepers stopped, hallelujah, in their celebration, they said, you know what? We cannot keep this good news to ourselves. Today is a good day. Today is a wonderful day. Today, God's love and grace, His loving kindness and His mercy is shining upon men. Today, I need to share. I can't hold it back. I have a medicine. I have a medicine that can cure every disease. I have a medicine that can cure sin. I have a medicine that can cure death. And His name is Jesus. I gotta share it. I have to give it. 
I have to be able, hallelujah, to distribute to everyone that is around me. In our salvation experience, it is culminated in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when you get full of His Spirit, you begin to praise Him. You begin to worship and praise Him with a new tongue. A tongue that you don't even understand. You, you get into a place where you are the praise of His glory. And, and when you get full of the Holy Spirit, God gives you the power to live a Spirit-filled life. Can someone sing praise God? A Spirit-filled life. That means you're full of the Spirit every day in the dictates of your life. Oh, hallelujah, are because the decisions that you make and, the, and even everything that you do, is, it comes out of, of that place of being of having God's of presence pour over you, hallelujah, every morning. And so you begin to walk in His power and, it, and you begin to illuminate Him. Because He is the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And, but then He says, now you are the light of the world. In other words, the, when Jesus lives inside of us, His light begins to shine. When we're, we're walking in Him, His light begins to shine through our life. It begins to work in our life and it begins to uh, pour over. It begins to spill over. It begins to move in places we did not expect for God's presence to move. And sometimes it can be something as simple as a prayer. About a month ago, a lady came to my office and she was, I saw her in the waiting room. I like to take breaks sometimes and I go downstairs and I walk around and I come back up. And so when I walked through the waiting room, I saw her and I recognized her, but she was just staring, just staring off into oblivion. She didn't move. And I said, oh, there's that lady. And I forgot her name. Her name is Senora Orly, very unique name. And so I saw her in the office. She sat down and she was in agony, she was crying, she was in tears, and she said, it's my fault. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? She says, well, she says, I refuse to get the vaccine. And my granddaughter has, she has some kind of a condition, you know, suppression, some kind of condition that she's, I'm not sure if her lungs were underdeveloped or what, she says, it's my fault and my granddaughter is extremely sick. And I got my daughter sick and I got my granddaughter sick. My household is sick. And she was blaming herself. And as, as, you know, as a man, what can I say to her, right? But as a child of God, I, saw, I began to lift the Lord up. And I said, you know what? I'm going to pray for you right now. Yes, yes. And you're going to come back. Yes. And you're going to tell me yes. that your child, your grandchild has been healed. And when she is healed, you're going to come to my church and you're yes. going to give thanks to God. And so I prayed for her in the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. I saw her on Friday. I saw her on Friday. She walked in the door and she was smiling. She couldn't stop smiling. She couldn't stop laughing. She said, God is so good. God is so good. My granddaughter is fine. Her breathing is fine. She's completely well. Oh, it just takes some prayer. Oh, because we are not connected oh, to someone who has no power, but we are connected with the all power for God. And so when we get to lift them up in prayer and in praise, and we bring people up into that choir and to that praise, oh, God begins to work in their life, and we got to take that step in Jesus' name. Oh, God is so good, Jesus says. Do not hide light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand and give it light to all who are in the house. Yes. Jesus said, don't put it under a basket. He used a specific term for that, which I can't repeat. I don't remember right now. But Charles Spurgeon responded to this and he says, poor, poor world. It is dark and it gropes in midnight. 
and it cannot get light except it receives it through us. And then the Aludi, who is another evangelist, said, poor, poor world, what a faint light it receives from most Christians. In other words, God calls us as a church to expose and to, and to, and to be a, 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 a vessel so that God's love, His light, His power, and strength can be known to everybody around us. But sometimes, or many times, we do not participate in that. And, and, and what are the reasons? Are we doing our own business rather than the Father's business? Are we caught up in stuff that we shouldn't be caught up in? Are we afraid about, concerned about our image? Are we concern, concerned that what people are going to say? But one thing I, wanted, I want to say in response to all those things, I want to ask you, was Jesus concerned about his appearance? When he was saving our souls, and he was stretched out wow. on that cross. Yeah. And he was breathing out his last breaths in agony for us. Yeah. What was he concerned about? Wow. What was he looking at? He was looking at us. He wasn't looking about how he looked. Oh, he wasn't worried about that. He wasn't concerned about that. The only thing that he knew that in the moment, hallelujah, when he would give up his last breath, that he would open up the way of salvation so that we could rush in, so that we could obtain that treasure of untold worth, all oh, that salvation, all oh, his, his spirit, all oh, that inheritance. That's what he was concerned about. He knew that in that moment he was about to open up that way and he was looking at the opportunity that he would give each and every one of us not to take his light of glory and put it under somewhere, but to take his light and put it up on a lampstand on the highest place of our life so that, hallelujah, his glory, his, his love could shine out in every single place where we would be. So we can lift it up like those Olympians that hold up the torch. They hold it up like this to light the way. Oh, but we represent something more than athleticism. Oh, we represent something more than sports. We represent the King of Glory. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ. We represent His salvation. We represent His goodness. We represent today is a good day, the gospel. One more example. Last Sunday, I, I had to work. And I was sitting down next to this doctor. He's an Indian doctor. His name is Amal Puswala. And I don't know how it came up. But I mentioned a book written by a Christian author by the name of C.S. Lewis. You've all probably heard of him. And so he he started asking me questions about Christianity. And I hadn't realized he had read the entire New Testament. And so many other, he's, he's read philosophers, et cetera, et cetera. And he started asking me and pressing me. But before that, before that happened, I began to feel the Holy Ghost. I began to feel the anointing. And, and, and sometimes you're gonna find this, okay? When you begin to feel the Holy Spirit and you're at work, you're not necessarily praying, but you're at work or you're at school and you feel the Holy Spirit, you feel His power. Pay attention. Look around. Because that means God is about to work in someone's life. Amen. And so I began to talk to him and I began to explain to him what it means to be a servant in Christ. And he was trying to talk about how, you know, if you're a servant, that you can be conquered, this and that. And I said, if you have that ideology, then you're left with, with, with fascism and communism and what the Nazis were trying to do. And he says, you're right. And I said, Amal, you're a servant. You are serving patience. 
And then he knew about the Bible, and he says, well, you know what, I really like the Old Testament because of the Ten Commandments. And I said, well, do you know the entire Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi talk about, it mentions and it prophesies about Jesus? He goes, really, where? He wanted to know. And so I started going, starting in Genesis, and then I went straight to, of course, Isaiah. He was receiving calls, like emergency calls, and I would go and see a patient, I'd come back, and I'd begin just to talk to him about the Lord. And at the end, I said, okay, Amal. And then he started getting very quiet. He stopped asking questions. He was like, okay, I'm kind of getting uncomfortable with this. And I said, it's okay that you feel that way. I will say that this is the end of the sermon. But whenever you are ready to open the word of God again, I am here to be able to, to tell you about Jesus, to be able to tell you about what God is all about in your life. Oh, young people, oh, my brother and sister, there are people all around us who are me, who are hungry. The person who you least expect is looking for that light. The person who you least expect is hungry and thirsty. And it just takes a moment for you to turn on that. Hallelujah, that switch. Oh, in the name of Jesus, begin to pray for them. In the name of Jesus, begin to speak to them. Oh, and let God's Holy Spirit work and speak through your life. In the name of Jesus. I was reading about, I believe it's a pastor who wrote about the watermark. And a watermark and we can stand, and we can stand at this time. A watermark is a faint design made in some paper during the manufacturing process. And it's visible only when it's held against light. And that watermark, the purpose is that it identifies the maker of that document. We are just like that. But except on the watermark, God has poured his blood on us. We are God's property. We belong to him. And then the Bible says that he has given us the seal for that day of redemption, his Holy Spirit. And when a watermark can be seen, you can see it when the light is shining through it. When the light of Jesus is shining through you, people know who you belong to. People know who you represent. You're not, just, you're not just preaching, but you are declaring with your life through his Holy Spirit, walking his spirit. And they say, oh my goodness, what is this? I want to know more about this light. They're not so much concerned about you. They want to know about what is it. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? What is this light? What is his power? And sometimes I'll stop, thank you. And you say, no, don't thank me. Thank the Lord Jesus. He is the one that is the source of this light. He is the one that is the source of this love. He is the one that is the source of this power. Worship him. Oh, hallelujah, lift him up. Oh, magnify his name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah.